Okay, so a while ago I released a peer review video about Nathan Oakley's shambolic hallway experiment and the feedback was pretty consistent. More of this, please. Now, of course, I'm happy to oblige because I have realized that it is fun to take the piss out of flat earthers, but there's one thing which can be even more fun, and that is taking them seriously. So I figured that I would have a little scout around for some more flat earth experiments, and to be honest, I didn't really have to look far because Anthony Riley, aka Sleeping Warrior, was very quick to deliver. Now before I start, I want to point out that I am reviewing the experiment. I will not be asserting anything about the shape of the Earth or whether Anthony's hypothesis is valid or not. I will only assess whether the experiment actually shows what he claims it shows and whether the procedure is fit for purpose and maybe suggest some improvements. So let's roll the clip. Gravity is not a force, but you can think of it as a force. Well, relative density is a force, and you must accept it as a force, even though the current science tells you that it's not. And for those that say that density is just a scalar, they're correct. I'm not referring to density, I'm referring to relative density, and specifically disequilibrium, because we know that that is a force. So now the bung gets put onto the top of the, top of the thing. Look, how is that not considered to be anything other than fantastic? We caused it, right? We've burnt the oxygen that's inside the, the, the conical flask. And I, to be honest, when, when we first did this, I thought that it was going to push the uh, syringe out, not pull it in. So it means that the exothermic reaction of the magnesium is less than the uh, effect of burning the oxygen that's inside the conical flask. But nonetheless, we can lift a weight. And let's remember that the gravitational effect is only 1 50 millionth. So we've definitely overcome the effect of gravity, haven't we, boys and girls? And we are demonstrating that with a little bit of thought and quite a lot of equipment, we can demonstrate that relative density, specifically the disequilibrium bit, does cause movement. The egg did move because of this. The cherry tomato will move because of that. So in the context of the bigger picture, everybody that questions why is it that the things move, if it's not gravity or buoyancy, the answer is this is proof that it is the relative density disequilibrium that's doing it. So here we have it. This is what Anthony claims to be evidence of gravity not being a thing and relative density actually explaining all the forces. And he also claims that this result agrees and confirms his egg experiment some way. But more on that at some other point. What we have here is a conical flask connected to a vertically suspended syringe which has a mass mounted on it. It is at some equilibrium position and he then places a burning piece of magnesium in the conical flask and closes the system and then he observes that the syringe moves up as the magnesium burns away. He argues that the density inside the flask changes and therefore it is density that only affects the position of the syringe and relative density and not gravity explains the position and the change in the position of this syringe. Well, this is a bit of a non sequitur. If we are being generous, then at best we can conclude that density is a factor. Let's take a simple equation where c is equal to a plus b, and these all represent arbitrary quantities. We do an experiment that shows that the value of a affects the value of c. Great, we would then be correct to conclude that a is one of the variables to determine c, but it would be really fucking stupid to conclude that a is the only variable. But let's get back to the experiment. We see quite a large strip of magnesium burning and being placed in the flask, so let's consider the chemical reaction that we observe. The equation for this reaction is that we have two atoms of magnesium combining with a single molecule of diatomic oxygen, and the result is that we have two magnesium oxide molecules. Now magnesium oxide is an ionic compound that forms a powder at the bottom of the conical flask once everything has settled. So the oxygen in the gas is actually locked up into a solid at the bottom. As we can see that not all the magnesium is burnt, we can conclude that the reaction ran out of oxygen, so all the oxygen has burnt. But let's go back to some diagrams. 
So here is a diagrammatic explanation of the experiment. Uh, we have the syringe and a flask, which are connected via a tube. A small mass is hanging off the syringe, but I haven't shown it in the diagrams here to save space. And we'll describe what Sleeping Warrior claims is happening, and then also describe what the generally accepted scientific theory states is happening. We start for the density argument. At sea level, the atmosphere has a finite density. The density of the internal gas pre-burn is the same as the density of the atmosphere and the plunger is at some equilibrium position. After the burn, as the oxygen is burnt away, the plunger is at a new equilibrium position such that the density inside the flask is once again equal to the atmospheric density. During the burn, the oxygen is taken out of the internal gas and is deposited at the bottom of the conical flask. The mass of the gas therefore decreases. Now, as density is the ratio of mass and volume, and the mass of the internal gas decreases, the volume must decrease by the same fraction as the fraction of the mass decrease for the internal and atmospheric densities to be the same, as is required by the final position being an equilibrium state. Now let's consider established scientific theory. Before the burn we have the following situation. We have two forces which are acting on the plunger in the equilibrium position. An upward force which is the product of the atmospheric pressure and the cross-sectional area of the plunger and a downward force which is the sum of the gravitational force acting on the plunger and the pressure inside the flask acting on the cross-sectional area of the plunger. At equilibrium pre-burn, the forces cancel out, so we have the force of gravity plus the internal pressure multiplied by the cross-sectional area of the plunger less the atmospheric pressure multiplied by the plunger cross-sectional area is equal to zero, where P subscript ATM is the atmospheric pressure, P is the internal pressure, A is the plunger cross-sectional area, and FG is the downward force due to gravity. We can rearrange that to Fg is equal to A multiplied by P atmospheric minus P. Now, given that P pressure is given by the product of the number of moles times the Boltzmann constant times the temperature over the volume, we can expect that F of G is equal to A in then brackets, P atmospheric minus NKBT over V. Now, given that F of G and P atmospheric remain constant along with A and the Boltzmann constant, accepted theory requires that the ratio N over V is constant as well for a constant value of T. So we can say that N initial over V initial must be equal to N final over V final. By mass, oxygen represents 23.2% of the atmosphere, and by number of particles, it represents 20.9% of the atmosphere. Both models predict the effect shown, but the extent by which the volume changes is different. If all the oxygen inside the flask and the syringe is burnt, then we would expect the volume to decrease by 23.2% if Sleeping Warrior is correct, and 20.9% if scientific theory is correct. But, as Sleeping Warrior thinks that he can do science without actually taking a single fucking measurement, we can't really tell which one is which from this demonstration. Why bother actually taking data which can be used to fit a model and then perform a hypothesis test? Surely, when you are trying to disprove an overwhelming body of evidence, you don't really need to treat it with the same level of rigor, right? Well, because of reasons? So. My advice to Anthony is that he goes back and tries again, but this time do the following. One is measure the volume of the conical flask. Two, set the plunger at the lowest possible position. The internal volume there is then the sum of the volume of the conical flask and a syringe. Measure this. It would be useful. Three, you burn the magnesium and wait for the system to reach thermal equilibrium with the surroundings. This is important. 4. Measure the final volume. And then 5. Repeat the experiment for different initial volumes by varying the plunger's initial position and maybe the conical flasks. 
because then you can plot the final volume against initial volume and both models predict a straight line equation with a slope equal to 0.768 in case of the relative density hypothesis and 0.791 in case of accepted theory. It is worth pointing out that the difference is small and therefore a large number of measurements are needed to keep the error small, so we need lots of repeats and some scientific rigor. If Riley's prediction is correct, we do need to find something else though, and this is a constant which allows us to relate relative density to force. I don't know what the magnitude of this coefficient is, but it does need to have units of meters to the power of five over seconds squared. The reasoning behind this is that he talks about relative density being a vector. We can then surmise that he's talking about the gradient of some scalar field, which is density. The gradient is the derivative of density with respect to distance, which given that density has units of kilograms per meter cubed, the vector field has units of kilograms per meter to the power of four and force has units of kilograms meters per second squared so our coefficient must have the dimensions of meters to the power of five over second squared in conclusion as it stands the experiment doesn't show a damn thing i have just outlined the methods for testing your hypothesis and i suggest that you follow them whilst making sure that you actually measure things and this is me being nice if you had written this up into a manuscript and submitted this to a scientific journal, you would probably get the following feedback. Reject the manuscript. I am astonished that this even passed desk review. Regardless of the stupidity of the point that they're trying to make, the experiment is clearly not fit for vaguely assessing the validity of their claim. The author expects to be published without performing a single fucking measurement or control of any confounding variables. I'm convinced that the experimenter have not spent any fucking time actually considering the problem they're trying to address. Reject the manuscript and make sure that the author is blocked from the submission system. In addition, please ensure that the editor is fired for letting this shit even get to review. And that would still be considered a nice response. Well, that was my review of Sleeping Warrior's little experiment, and let's hope that he takes the feedback on board and resubmits something which has been subject to a little bit more thought. So I'll start signing off by plugging my pluggables, and you can find me on Patreon, where I've just created new tiers and rewards, and one of those will entitle you to punish me by requesting that I review an experiment. There are also tiers which entitle you to my input during experimental design. Yes, I am a mercenary who shamelessly whores out his skill set for money. So if you want to punish me, get my input or something, or just financially support me, then go over to my Patreon and be as awesome as Kevin Dedman, Dr. Thomas Miller, MC Toon and Stringer News 1. But that's it for me. Until next time.